Greetings, Payer Orphans and Retrogrades. Welcome to CMask. Today, we are going to be talking about the age of absconding fathers. We live, that is to say, in the age of absconding fathers. So said the late Pope Benedict. And it's highly relevant to both, of course, the news since Benedict passed away on December the 31st. And there's been lots of fallout, but also to several of the different shows that we have done here on the Christian Masculinism podcast. With me today are my friends, Will Nolan, Michael Robillard, and Elliot Hulse. How are the three of you gentlemen doing? Hopefully well. Doing well, brother. Please doing well, man. Thanks, Tim. Well, fatherhood, Good great to see. topic. Yeah. Yeah, so... I mean, I wanted to start out just by saying, look, it's an opening shot. It's it's an opening shot and it's relevant. It, it's catalyzed a couple of conversations uh, between me and Mike. So, Mike, I, I wanted to go to you first that our most recent Holy Father says, look, if we if we live in the age of absconding fathers and that he said that right before he absconded. I don't know if he was trying to punctuate the point or what, but it's it's frightening. And we've spoken about how much in the last couple of generations, it seems clear that forget absconding for a second. We'll talk about that most of the show. But even for those fathers that that haven't absconded in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, the the prospect of fatherhood is diminished. There's been a diminution to the point that it sounds strange when you hear a guy like Elliot or Will or me dialoguing with each other about how very intentional fathering should be. It, it strikes the ears as foreign. That's how normal the abnormal has become to either abscond or if you don't abscond just to as a as a as a father in a family to just treat it like, you know, another task in your day. And it's not particularly special over everything else you do besides be a husband. Remember, I mean, we, I think you said that Mike, when we were talking about um, a common Elliot made with the way he fathers his boy. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I mean, I mean, yeah, we, we've talked about this at length where it's just, we don't want to put everything in the, the boomer generation and, and turn it into another victim narrative. But, um, yeah, it's just from what I saw growing up uh, in my own life, and then in all, all the sons and all the people that I knew, their their fathers as well. It's like that whole generation seemed uh, oddly unintentional with respect to fathering, um, in relation to to what you guys are doing now. And um, I'm just wondering, like, yeah, what what happened? You know, what was this? lack of transmission of cultural knowledge, lack of transmission of identity and responsibility between the greatest generation to the boomers and then to us. Um, and it's been a puzzle that I've been solely trying to put together for the entirety of my life, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, what this, this diminishing of cultural knowledge and, and cultural transmission, like what, what explains it and, uh, how do we, how do we get it back? What, what does a, a return to proper proper malehood and, and really well how that happened uh it, so in the book iron john by robert bly he does a great job describing that exact split and when it happened during the industrial revolution you know we talk quite a bit about how you know women working outside the home is a scourge to the family but it wasn't until after the industrial revolution that fathers worked outside of the home we mm. were in agrarian culture maybe right. they were you know, uh, doing some sort of uh, creative work with iron or shoe making or basket weaving or whatever the skill that the man knew how to do that was passed on by his father, he taught to his children, mm. he taught to his sons. And so sons and fathers work very closely together to make number one, the boy a worthy contribution to the family and to the, and to the culture. And also because, well, there was no factory for the dad to leave and mm. go and mm -hmm. be apart, be apart from the family, earning his money, and then only to come back home to children that just don't know him, to sons that don't really need him, who children that are being educated in different ways to do different things rather than that which their father knows. 
it's funny they said yeah my my dad was a warehouse worker for like 50 years and uh yeah so that that there was that split like i would go to school he would go off and do work stuff and it was there was just this opaque wall it was just mystery where he just does job things and then he comes home and he's exhausted and uh it's it's a mystery as to like what 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 is the father doing for right in in that well, space that's what happens so there becomes a uh the curiosity, but then a distrust of the father as a result, because the son wants to know what is the father doing? That right. then becomes the question. And so that it ends up being suspect. The father then becomes suspect because I can't see what he's mm. doing. If the son can't see what the father's doing. Then what uh, Robert Bly says is that, um, well, essentially there's a hole in the heart and then demons fill that hole. He doesn't know what his father does. If you don't know what your father does, there's a hole. But right. Demons fill that hole. Yeah, I think Will, that's a, it's a great explanation. Well, do you, are we speaking another form of English here? Or, or is this something that was witnessed widely, at least in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in England uh, on your side of the pond as well? Yeah, not only that, but it goes back earlier the French counter-revolutionary writers like Louis de Bonald, uh, they said uh, not only was divorce one of the great threats to the security and stability of the family, but industrialization as well, for precisely the reasons that Elliot's just outlined there. And what you get is a, a damaging of the social bonds of the family, the village, and the church, leading to alienation of men from each other because the market becomes the dominant social institution. And this is a bad thing because you weaken that sense of what would have been a lifelong apprenticeship and bond between father and son working in some kind of family business. That was traditional until relatively recently. This idea that when your kid is 18, you let go of them. That's a relatively novel concept in human history. Bizarre. Parenting is a lifelong bond and duty. So some people can't wait to get rid of their kids. Even 18 is too late. It's like 16. You should be thinking about paying your own way and getting out of the house. That's a tragic set of affairs. Is there, is there a kind of reciprocity of repudiation here father of the son and son of the father because i uh, not to get overly literary but i took a course at uh pontifical gregorian university called it was was mainly literature even though i was a philosophy major um it was it was about dostoevsky nietzsche and kierkegaard each have a strong repudiation of the father by the son uh, kierkegaard famously tells a story about he found out that his his father had his father had uh, cursed God when he was young. You know, they they were Protestants, of course. And there's a, a a note of repudiation there. And then, of course, he writes "Fear and Trembling" famously about you know Adam, Adam uh, sorry Abraham and Isaac. Uh, should Isaac feel bad that his father was willing to give him up? Should there be a repudiation not only of the, the father for the son, but but in the reverse as well? And then, of course, Dostoevsky, what, what more do we need to say? The actual patricide of Fyodor Karamazov by the four sons and Dostoevsky's big idea is that even saintly Alyosha helped in, in an unwitting way to the patricide of his father, his three wicked brothers, uh, all did so in a more direct way. But in the postmodern era, we're tempted to think the repudiation of the father is a completely natural thing. And, and Nietzsche repudiates his, his Lutheran father as well as he becomes an atheist. So in what sense, I'll go back to you, Mike, in what sense is this a twofold thing? I don't know if I buy it. I mean, a, a son always wants to be loved by his father. We live for one reason or another in the age of absconding fathers. But it, did you buy this, that there's a kind of twofold repudiation happening here in the postmodern era? 
I mean, yeah, the, there might be. Um, I mean, look, we're we're um we're told to to honor our mother and father. So I think our our orientation as sons to fathers needs to to have some degree of grace and, and charity towards um you know where our fathers are coming from. Um so I'm not sure how how um how harsh we're we're allowed to judge, you know. Um I, I you know it's a it's a it's a tricky balance. Yep. Elliot I see I don't I don't mean like should sons repudiate their fathers or anything any more than Benedict the 16th meant that fathers should repudiate their sons obviously not aside from the marital bond you know the bond between father and his kids is the most sacred uh, of all the natural human relationships but is there a kind of societal widespread distancing that is attributable to more than just the father is this all on fathers look are our families not close generally speaking anymore because of fathers or is there some sort of you know reciprocity happening what do you say elliot oh yeah absolutely 100 percent comes with the flattening of the generations rather than the vertical integration of the family where i mentioned previously that this idea of um commoditization or standardization that we see in commerce with you know mcdonald's is mcdonald's wherever you go so you know what you're going to get when you go there and you speak the same language and this people are going to buy they've done this with generations i don't know how long this has been the case but i don't imagine in biblical times that they just flattened each generation out by 10 years so we've got you know gen z we got millennials we got so on and so on and so on and so, on and so forth it's just like layers and layers of cakes flattened down mm. so that that then becomes the peer group and they look side to side for instruction and direction and uh, inclusion, the sense of being seen by their peers, where previously the vertical integration was, well, I know what my dad knows and I dress like my dad, I think like my dad, and he does so like his dad too. And there was a, there was a more of a vertical integration that allowed the family to be the most prominent uh, instructor and guider and mirror of the children. This has all been a result of, of commercialization. Like I love, I'm not a anti, uh, uh, capitalist, but done in the way that it's done right now, where it's more important to speak a word and sell as much as we can, regardless of the damage it does to the family is what we've got by standardizing generations. They can standardize their marketing and therefore sell more and control more. The one, one of the topics that's kind of always lurks in the background that we ain't afraid to touch here on CMASK, and I'm not afraid to touch it on, on Rules for Retrogrades writ large, is what is to be the importance of kinship groups? This is another thing me and Mike kind of talk about one-on-one -on -one a lot. I mean... The big unifier for republics and polities in general is definitely religion morality. That's that's what you have to have the same. So these new ethno nationalists, they want they want race to be the big thing. And we usually say, no, it's got to be religion morality. But none of us here deny the importance of uh, it's much less. But there is an importance to ethnicity and kinship likeness and that's only true, Will, to the extent that it means families are really, really close. Everything Elliot just said is the entire basis for the, even though it's mitigated, for whatever extent of importance we grant to a republic's unicity of kin kinship groups, right? Like if you're really close with your dad, it takes two things for, for ethnicity to matter a lot, the way the ethno-nationalists want and I would say America in the West and probably Great Britain anymore doesn't have either of them. One is you have to have really strong father-son relationships. That's the whole basis for kinship groups. And the other one is you have to be really set in a, in a place. There's got to be a strong sense of place. You can't just move from California to Mississippi like I did because then you'd be moving away from your people. So I think there's mutual information, mutual formation of these ideas here. What, what do you think, Will? Yeah, I think that's accurate. And it comes back to a point we've made before about how 
the Decalogue is ultimately just a privileged expression of natural law. So that bond between father and son, honor thy mother and father, that's related to honoring God the Father, capital F. And part of the attack on patriarchy has been both of those things coming under attack. So we weaken religion. And by doing so, we also weaken the family because people become more broken up and atomized. So the reason you need religion as the unifying factor or force in a republic is that only then can you have, as you say accurately, multiple ethnicities forming one nation, whereas you can't have one ethnicity making up a nation without religion. There have been many failed racially pure cultures throughout history to give evidence of the fact that race by itself is not sufficient to sustain culture. When religion goes, it's only a matter of time before your civilization just evaporates. But to the but, people out there, and, and it's it's the, you know, people that I, I, I agree with on most many other points uh, tend to be kind of the, the new right. Some of the some of the fringe guys in the new right tend to be ethno nationalists who are also Catholic. I have a lot of them in my audience and they they think it's a cope. It's like, look, man, you know me. I would say what I really believe. But I would let me just put it this way. If I'm forming a polity. And I could pick like a NBA draft. I, what other families do I want in my polity? I'm going to want this British guy, Will. I'm going to want Michael. I'm going to want Elliot. And and your families are, you, you know, present and future families. Come one, come all. And that's what a guy, Will, that's, you know, from across the pond. That's what Elliot, who's, uh, you know, an ethnic mix of lots of stuff that doesn't doesn't look just like me. And I'm not saying that because of kumbaya pluralism. I'm saying that because what else do you want of me? I'm not a LARP. I'm not live action role playing. Like in America, we don't have in, in anywhere in the 21st century. We denizens of the 21st century don't have strong kinship groups. Sorry. Family of origin issues is like what you learn to speak when you turn 21. What are your family of origin issues? What's your family trauma? It's a shame. And it's a postmodern shame to be precise, but there's no way you can be like, oh, yeah, yeah, k k kinship groups are really strong. Everyone should look like each other when everybody's like like 80 percent of the uh, society or 70 percent of the society is on antidepressants because they have such a horrible relationship with their their family. And half the people out there almost are divorced. Does this make sense? I, I don't think people I don't think the new right particularly the ethno-nationalists, have connected those dots. Maybe for another time you can talk about ethnicity mattering. Not now. Does that make sense to you, Elliot? Because I'm kind of going on the strength of your point. A family's got to look the way you described it before these guys can even get started. Yeah, well, you know, you're saying that we don't have anything in common, but in a way we do, and it's basically the postmodern culture. So it's Hollywood, right? Like, so everyone's trying to be different, but in truth, they're trying to be the same. They're doing what the Hollywood uh, actors do. They follow what uh, Lord government tells them to do. It is uh, it is a religion, but it's just a false religion. It's an ape of the church. And that's why everybody's, uh, you know, they're ailing and failing because we are united in the ship that's going down. Yeah, and of course, my point with you three gents is we're united by creed, and that, that's what matters most to me. Uh, but more than just creed, a specific, very intentional devotion to creed and devotion to the lifestyle entailed by that creed that a lot of people that claim to be Catholic aren't. So to me, that's always what's most important. I'm just, I'm anticipating a counter argument. It, and it's, it's not like I'm Nostradamus. I just occasionally read the remarks and whenever we've touched on ethno-nationalism here in CMS people get people get really mad for the opposite reason that people out there in the outside world get mad and they're like hey man like ethnicity matters so I was like it does some I'm not I'm not it's not nothing I'm not saying it's nothing I'm just saying even even Pius the 12th who treats of the question in an encyclical says it's not nearly as important 
as unicity of religion. But but my whole point was, look, if you guys want to get started, you got to deal with these these uh, father son issues first. And you can't really do any. Let's get back to the atomization of the father son issues. All you can really do in an era that's beset by absconding fathers, as Benedict the Sixteenth said, is work on it with your son. You can't really do it with your father. Uh, uh, Elliot, I'm not saying you necessarily need to. You you speak as if you, you you might be an exception to the rule here, but the son is on the receiving end, and pretty much, I I don't know. This is how me and Mike talk. Every one of my friends who went to church, if they were Catholic, they were dragged there by their mothers. Now, among my friends in that little society, we had very different relationships with our father. You could put them on a spectrum from relatively amicable to relatively not. But the very fact that none of us was being drugged to church by our fathers or confession or really it, it, it wouldn't be dragging then right when it's a, a woman doing the replacement of the role of the father it's dragging when it's the father i'd have had a whole different outlook and I, i'm not complaining i mean my dad's a good man really well respected man but something's something's missing even evidenced by the fact that we were all drugged to church by our mothers What do you say, Will? I mean, is this an American thing or is this a a uh, late twentieth century thing? That's what I'm trying to figure out when 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 I ask you. That is much broader than just America. I think it's just characteristic of the West generally over the last few decades, and not only in the sphere of religion. Although I think that the rot starts there, but discipline more broadly speaking. If you look at what secular academics say about discipline and boundaries within the home when you get an absent biological father is very revealing and it dovetails well with what you're talking about there with moral instruction let me read you a couple of the studies that i was looking at here so we've got uh, a big longitudinal study in the us of 2733 children that concluded that kids of biological fathers who were highly involved in their upbringing had better outcomes than children of other family structures or low involved biological fathers in particular this is what i found most interesting the adolescent children of highly involved biological fathers had significantly fewer behavioral problems on the outcomes measured which were these ones so externalizing behavior like arguing and lying delinquency negative feelings like sadness, nervousness, and tiredness, but also internalizing behavior, like being withdrawn, for example. So if you think about the impact that a biological father has, and it goes beyond even what a stepfather being present in the home might achieve. Some people find that offensive, but the biological father does more than a stepfather does in terms of benefiting the teenage sons in particular. It's all about boundaries, discipline and confidence and these are some of the very things that we talk about when it comes to a crisis of masculinity in the west isn't it so it stems from the weak father role yeah this is exactly this is the reason i wanted to do this show is not just in some sort of perverse doff of the cap to now deceased pope benedict i mean he gave us this great sort of pointer hey this era is marked by fathers who flee and then he then he fleed the irony is too thick but it's not just that it's that in some ways i see this what, what is this our 14th show that we've done together now 14th c mask time goes fast as the central issue i i i find it as the central genealogical issue etiological issue uh when we're seeking what what's the first cause of all this why is masculinity in such a crisis? It's because any any masculinity that one sees subsequent to, posterior to, an absconding father is going to be an aping aping of masculinity. You, you need that model. Elliot, this goes back to what you were saying. You need that model of 
being around your dad a lot as a son instead of having this mystery mystery man return home he's quiet he watches a beer uh, watches a uh, ball game in his chair with a beer and goes to sleep and he's not he's not mean to you but you know you just have to be quiet when you're playing with your truck anywhere within 20 feet of his chair you just like it's kind of like who's in my daily life in this model and i'm i'm not saying this is my my childhood this this wasn't it but this is the you know even the greatest generation seems to have been raised on this model mothers and then the women who are school teachers these are the main two adults in the life of a kid if that's his relationship with his dad how does masculinity grow um straight and fair like a tree that doesn't have too much shade i don't see how it can and this seemed to be what you were saying elliot yeah, it's tough because, you know, a, a young boy, a boy would like to look up to his dad, but a lot of times it's hard to look up to his dad because his dad is not living up to the archetype of father. And it's probably because his father didn't live up to the archetype of father. Um, or he rejected the archetype of father in his father because he grew up in the 1960s where they were revolted against anything masculine at that time and started growing his hair and smoking pot and having free love. And so maybe the father was good. I can't help but to think just based on the stream of my uh, talk here that a lot of this probably reached, started to reach its crescendo in the 1960s. And therefore, boys of this generation who say we're two generations later, uh, look at their dads and they look at their dad's ass and they're either just soft unrespectable men, men that I wouldn't want to be. Um, and I have to look elsewhere for a pattern of masculinity. And when you look elsewhere, well, what do you get? You usually get masquerading men as being masculine, which are the pussy chasers and the fast car drivers and the guys who snort cocaine and tell you that, you know, being a man is about shouting and, and, and you know, being a degenerate. So to fix this is tough. Like there has to be at least a handful of men, proud to say that I'm amongst you men, uh, but a handful of men that understand the role of traditional masculinity, the role of the traditional father, what a traditional family actually, actually looks like. And I, I would say that in a way we're blessed because that could have all been totally lost had it not been for the internet, which gives us access to conversations like this, other men like this. And the proliferation, the proliferation of information, of course, you know, internet is one thing, but the books and the access to ideas uh, will be the seed for, I guess you could say, a countercultural movement that I think is already starting to happen, um, where there's a return to the father. I mean, it says it in the Bible too, right? I will return the children to their fathers. And so I think in a way, as bad as it is, we're actually seeing the seedlings of a return and for that we have some hope mike so everything ellie ellie you're hitting it out of the park here today everything elliot just said to me i i sorry i i, I went away from it and i kind of want to go back to it for a second the topic of ethnicity kinship groups it's like yeah i well i agree with everything elliot just said except for this one thing it's not quite a return if a fatherhood really robustly conceived skipped a couple generations three four five generations i think even the greatest generation it skipped and you know we want to reclaim that this generation wants to return to strong fathers that's not the same thing as sons returning to our fathers right that that's actually doing the opposite in a sense it's very countercultural with regard to our endemic culture it means we're doing the opposite it means like no no, no I, i'm bringing my son with me kind of wherever I go or not, not wherever I go, but lots of places. I, I want my son to want to talk like me, to walk like me, to dress like me, to handle confrontation like me, to handle mercy like me. That's beautiful. And that, that is what I want. And I put in effort 24 hours a day at that. And that's different. That's countercultural. So it brings me back more strongly to the point I was beginning to make before and this is this is a couple of your big big talking points or just big inquiry points how do we how does anyone honestly say yeah kinship groups are a strong basis for forming a republic if 
the entire template for what young men want is found on the internet, not from the elders in their family. That has to be, a, and I'm not saying you represent uh, ethno-nationalism because you don't, but this has to be a stumbling block for them if they're having an honest look at this, right? It, Elliot said it, the, the internet, even in the red pill movement, that ain't us, we're, we're Christian masculinists. But whether it's red pill, Christian masculinism, conservatism writ large, trad Catholicism writ large, these are all groups of self-identifying people that find others on the internet, around the world, on social media platforms, because they're not really finding it by looking up in their family tree. Yeah, or or necessarily around in their whatever their their local ethnic group. Yeah, so I think that yeah, the world the world that we're in right now is this syncretic mix of old and new where yeah we are returning to tradition but it's like v- via zoom it's via twitter and and um the internet and um yeah i think that there the puzzle one of the puzzles is going to be how how do we manage those things uh together in a way that's harmonious you know um i've had a a lot of desire to want to to get into homesteading and basic things like hunting fishing farming canning food you know gardening that type of stuff i can learn it on the internet but i actually have to go out and do it and get my hands dirty and um but i think things like that you know we mentioned how divisive or how corrosive the industrial revolution was for the family structure or the kinship structure or the the religious parish and it's only gotten worse with the internet and web 2.0 and smartphones and whatnot um but we can use those things wisely to to um to build things that, that are new and flourishing so i think it's to my mind is it's going to be a question of how, how do we manage the old and the new to make something that's that's flourishing and durable and and, and worth worth fighting for and preserving yeah you you can forget about strong kinship groups unless you first have strong families as the foundation because kinship groups grow out of families Mm -hmm. then they extend into a nation so the the root of it is the original social cell and that's been attacked in various ways capitalism is one of them and chesterton said it did more damage than communism partly because communism never really got as much of a chance to have as widespread damage as capitalism has done. He said it would have done more had it done so, but as it is, capitalism's done the most damage to weaken the father-son bond. The other thing, though, in addition to industrialization, is definitely the sexual revolution. And there's a lot of intellectual substance, false intellectual substance, but it's there nonetheless, with guys thinking it's somehow natural for men to ejaculate and evacuate they think this is what a dude is supposed to do and if you go back and look at what aquinas says in summer contra gentiles he argues that it is abundantly evident that the female in the human species is not at all able to take care of the upbringing of offspring by herself since the needs of human life demand many things which cannot be provided by one person alone Therefore, it is appropriate to human nature that a man remain together with a woman after the generative act. So when we say that monogamy is natural, we mean that it is fitting for man's nature as a rational animal and the way that men and women are supposed to cooperate and are complementary for the benefit of children and marriage is ultimately about that stable foundation. It's not natural in the sense of does it happen? Like murder happens, for example, rape happens in nature in the way that these guys misconceive the term. But that doesn't mean that it befits man's rational nature. That's why monogamy produces the most successful societies. And if you mess with the biological father in the home, then you're messing with the whole social order. And that's the ultimate tragedy that the West is living through now. Will, isn't it that those are great points, I, which I love and agree with. Aside, aside from one, I want to push back on this issue. Communism 
declared war on the family in the, the un, univocal sense, you know, the, in the a literal sense. Communism literally made it uh, incentivized abortion and incentivized uh, women to get out of the home, even forced women to get out of the home and said this is its first goal is destroying the Western nuclear family, which is the same thing Black Lives Matter announced three summers ago. To say capitalism has ultimately maybe incidentally done more damage to kids, it might be right. But as a system of sort of omissionary replacing uh, value replacement, let's say that omissionary value replacement, whereupon fathers stand down and just I, I, I see, I, I guess it's a chicken and the egg thing. I don't think capitalism actually is averse to strong families. I think it's neutral. And I know you don't hear that point much anymore, but I, I feel like I, I feel it incumbent on me to say it. Cause like your kids, my kids, Elliot's kids, they're not going to like go do what any, whatever Coke or Pepsi tells them to do. I'm like, that's stupid, man. Yeah. We, we have the TV on some we're watching, we were watching the Mavs Lakers game last night and there are all kinds of commercials for all kinds of immoral things mild mild vices mainly but i'm like that's stupid don't listen to that my son goes like this i mean this is literally how we watch tv together and he'll ask me he'll say dad is that is this player cool i'll say yeah that's luka Doncic. he's cool is that guy cool yeah that's spencer dinwiddie yeah he, he's cool he threw down two two monster dunks in last night's game is dad is lebron james cool no don't that guy's not cool so like your son will ask you and with capitalism with a father doing his job, which is to mix metaphors and go into soccer a little bit, to be goalkeeper. So, I, you know, with me being a relatively, I don't know, having a capacious uh, appreciation for my my view, uh, my role as the goalie, I'm not too worried about what capitalism is doing to my kids. Is that naive? Or what do you say, Will? And then and then Elliot and Mike, what do you say? I think it's an important question that's getting yeah, yeah. re-raised a lot today. I think that's exactly the right point to make. Chesterton says that communism would have done far more damage. It's inherently evil. Capitalism isn't inherently evil because it's founded on the need for private property. And this is a natural right for families due to the father's protector role and passing it down through the generations. The French counter-revolutionary writers were really adamant about the need for the father's estate um, not to be broken up on his death and for it to be handed on to the eldest son to keep it all together and strengthening the role of the patriarch. They understood that well, and all that is uh, capitalist concepts and how they relate to the family. So there's a good counterpoint to make, Tim. Yeah. Did you know? Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that that um, one Chesterton was in the Fabian Society? Number two, that he in part of his, I think it was his five point plan, Chesterton's to get everyone property. He actually was for that aspect of the French Revolution where fathers couldn't devise land to their sons. In other words, you're kind of just a remainder man on land. A lot of people don't know that about Chesterton. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. So the, the guys like uh, Louis de Bono, the Tour de Pin, Keller, they're all saying, no, we, we, we can't have that. We want to keep the whole estate together. So they were, I think, correct where Chesterton was wrong there. But his point about making the market the dominant social institution when it's amoral and has this potential just to make being a man solely a, a monetary thing, that has weakened the family in the way that he described and that we're pointing out here. Um, your point about how fathers can explain what's good and what's bad and retain their authority, but also get the benefits of capitalism. I think that's, that's the way it should be done. Yeah. Uh, Elliot and Mike, do you want to respond to that? Not so much capitalism versus uh, communism. I just wanted to s see what Will would say to that, but to the econ the crass economic interest that has been, in in our system in our world now has been taken to be the greatest role that a father subserves i mean to be a father is a it's a vocation and if you say that we do four four main things you know uh we're the spiritual priest we protect we play and we provide generally speaking all over the west 
fathers heard a few generations back up to now. Yeah, I'll provide. I'm not going to pray with. I'm not going to play with. I, I'm not really going to protect or, or teach to fight my sons. Those three, which are all probably more important than the crass economic provision. What happened there? And I mean, like, I don't think it's the fault of capitalism necessarily. I think it's the fault of fathers themselves. But maybe to some extent, it's got to be have something to do with capitalism because it's system wide. What do you yeah. say, Elliot and Mike? Yeah, right. Well, wherever there's a pretend, uh, propendency towards dereliction, there will be a usurpation. And so that we see this in the garden where Adam gives up his right and responsibility and Eve is right there, very happy to take it. And so if the government's going to raise your kids, if the government's going to train your children, feed your children, educate your children, give them the state religion, then a lot of men uh, without the pressure to have to do that because it was lifted off of their plate as a responsibility or a burden uh, will just go along with it because it's much easier to drink beer and watch sports. Well, you agreed. What do you say, Mike? I think capitalism in its rightful relation to, to the parish and to the religious life is beneficial but what gets problematic is when every when people start seeing the world as everything being a market right and start seeing every person being fundamentally a homo economicus and not being the, the anthropology of man as being properly you know divinely created with with a telos that, that is ordered correctly so i think yeah there's that that whole saying like the the temple isn't the market that's what makes it the temple and I think that that, you know, as long as we keep that in mind, then, then we have a proper relationship between the market and the temple. So then things are good. It's, things get out of hand when things, things that ought not be commodified or ought not be regarded as transactional market things become uh, such, right? So when the market bleeds into things like family relations or, or, or relations between persons, that's the um that's the perniciousness of it but is this what happened i mean i'm i'm asking as as sincerely as i've ever asked a question uh you know on, on a live stream is this what happened how for at least three generations if not four or more what the hell happened like how how is this so ubiquitous that everyone remember at school I don't think any of us were homeschooled at school in fourth, fifth, sixth grade teachers would ask, uh, it would be like a project. I had a, a school project on it. Like who's your hero. This should be a ridiculous redundant to ask once type of question. It should be my father. My father's my hero, but this isn't how they had us thinking. And that's not all. And I mean, I don't think that they, it was like a giant psyop. I think it was more a symptom of, of the era that the teachers lived in. Who's your hero? Is it Michael Jordan or is it Michael Jackson? You know, if you were in the 80s. And I, I don't think a bunch of our fathers were insulted by the question. I think, I think, I remember I got asked this in fourth grade. And I can't remember if my dad was like, well, do you want to maybe do what I do? But it's not just what you do for a living that, you know, that, that should have insulted him. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I wanted to go be a geologist. My older brother was a geologist, applied the family trade, a petroleum geologist like my father. I, I never really wanted to do that, but that's not the only reason that it's insulting. You know, when your teacher asks a young boy, who's your hero, it should be obvious. I have a father in the home, but it didn't strike me then. And I don't even know how insulted it, it, made my father so did you guys remember this like the assumption that your hero is going to be someone other than your your father as a male exemplar yeah yeah it was almost always some type of sports or like um so some type of sports celebrity or or it'd be like i don't know maybe a hollywood celebrity but usually sports celebrity you might be in dramatic uh will or or is this i i am i trying to tease too much blood from the turnip here or like is this a real phenomenon that needs to be identified and repudiated like your father should be your hero and it should i mean 
not in the sense of like gaslighting young boys from abusive homes or negligent homes. I mean, it should be your father should have provided you the ample basis to say he's your hero. And then you ought to rightly acknowledge it. I think that's exactly what happened. And one of the reasons that you get so many guys looking at whether it's a heavyweight boxer or a quarterback or whoever it might be as their masculine idol is because they haven't had one close to them growing up. And that's partly because single motherhood was incentivized by the state and the provider protector role was weakened and eventually supplanted. So they haven't actually had anybody fulfilling that noble, self-sacrificial masculine role close to them. So they can think that's how it's done. And that's what I want to aspire to and to give to my son as well. Although, like Elliot's saying, with the seedlings of a revival, a lot of guys have felt the pain from not having that and recognize the value of it. There's that father-shaped hole. And now they want to make sure that it doesn't happen to the next generation. What do you say, Elliot? Uh, about what? <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're the guy who most consistently across these shows. Well, for one thing, you're the guy that I think provided the rigorous routine you just by by naming your rigorous routine that you do with your son that i think made michael remark wow that's really intentional and then you know i chipped in a lot and will chipped in a lot too but i think you made the original predicate remark and then you've also said across some of these 13 shows before now that you did get some of this from your dad um and, and you know i i got some of my fathering from my dad too but but like no small amount of it from your dad so does it sound accurate to say that, you know, a, a rec can a reclamation be done at the, you know, society wide level? I hope so. Yeah, but I don't think we do it. I think this is a promise from the Lord. I think this is God's pattern. Uh, we see it in cycles as it happens throughout history. Uh, I I have a sense that we are riding a wave that is at the beginning of its crest. We're sort of sensing that there's something wrong, but at the same time, God provides the solution. Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, a lot of times I look for problems, but then try to create the steps to solving the problem, realizing that my own fallen logic is not going to get there. I have to have faith. I got to have trust. And I just got to put one foot in front of the other and do the best that I can with what I got every single day. And I think that if we're looking for a means by which we can bring things back, well, we're reaching in the dark. But if we have faith and we keep our eyes open, remain vigilant and speak words of faith into others, that this is going to be God's plan unfolding as he promised the children will return to their fathers. And so by whatever means that is or how that happens, you know, it's from our mouths to God's ears. Let me put it this way. I don't think I'm being dramatic here either. I, I, I'm saying that a lot this show. If fathers were doing their jobs, then this whole sea mask project that that the four of us have elected to work on together would not be a thing okay it, the most boring thing in the world with no novelty to add to offer the world would be like hey here's what masculinism ought to look like here's what being a man ought to look like what being a father and what being a son ought to look like people would be like i know dude i know what are you talking about if we lived in a properly ordered society i don't even mean some platonic perfect society i just mean a half decent one then we we never would have gotten together on this show. Do, do you agree with that much, Elliot? It's only interesting because it's there's such a paucity of it. Yeah, there was a vacuum. There's a vacuum that is will naturally be filled, right? And nature abhors a vacuum. So as the father has receded in the eyes and in the hearts of society, there's opportunity. And I don't even... So I started making YouTube videos in 2012 and just was not aware of, you know, how big this problem was, but very quickly began to realize that there are a generation of young men that are looking to me to answer fatherly questions. They're seeing me as a father figure. Uh, quite frankly, I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't think that I was 
ready for that. I didn't want to take on that kind of responsibility because I didn't even realize that it was a thing. Um, but again, without me making plans to be an exemplary father, an example for what boys should follow in order to repair the damage in our world, God just put me in that place the same way he put the four of us together. And those who are watching these videos or those who are or are watching our videos or those who are called and God is speaking into their hearts. And they're, you know, the boys that are watching, the young men that are watching me, you, and, and all these videos, they're not watching because they, they, because they know we're right. They're not watching because this is aligned with what they have grown up with and what they understand. They're watching because they're hungry. And that very hunger is what's going to fuel this, this movement, boys hunger for father energy. Let's just hope that we're doing a good job to, and, and I tell you, this is a big part of the reason why I came back to the faith because I saw what was happening. I'm like, wow, these I'm leading a lot of young men. I had better be leading them in the right direction. And I know if that they were following me for my sake, I'm leading them off a cliff because I'm a fallen man and I'm gonna make mistakes. So I think this goes part and parcel with return to not just father figures, earthly fathers, but a return to Christendom, a return to God the Father. It's all happening at the same time. I see it. It's kind of shocking to watch how many young men are turning back to Christ and seeking God the Father in their lives who tell me, you know, a year ago, two years ago, I, it was unimaginable to themselves. So it's just, it's what's happening, bro. Just to bring that point, which I love, back to Catholicism, Pope just means father or papa, and papacy is patriarchy. So when we talk about patriarchy and the importance of fathers, that's it in terms of the hierarchical structure of Catholicism. Papacy is patriarchy. Amen. That's a great point. I mean, that is the highest role of the father. Oh, oh, well, um, yeah. you, papa means pope. We've had 266 of them. If if we're being told correctly, we've had 266 of them. Number 265 left us to more like an a, abusive stepfather of number 266. And that's a, a hell of a shame. But I mean, this is arguably in that list of roles that a father fills. This is the greatest one. Tell, show the son. Not that, not that, hey, bow to me. That's that's not it. It's, you know, you're you're beneath me now because I'm raising you. I'll always be your father. Act rightly, but worship the king. Who's the king? Jesus. I have a big, big crucifix up here in this room. I wish you guys could see a giant. That's the king. Here's how you genuflect to the king. Here's how you make a proper genuflection. Here's how you do what's pleasing to King Jesus. That's what a man does. Um, you don't say, hey, I'm the man, do like I do. You know, that, that's where you get into the Cobra Tate stuff, like, like Elliot's talking about. The highest role is here's how you receive the Eucharist. Here's how you salute. How's you, how, here's how you give what's propitious and fitting to the God man, the king, King Jesus. Isn't it? I mean, this is, this is the highest role uh, a dad can teach. So you're not connecting to like parallel lines that ain't, intended to be connected well. Yeah, this is absolutely right. The highest role of the father is to point his son at Jesus. And so there's an absolute connection to return to fathers and return to Christian patriarchy. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that, uh, going to confession with my son, that he could see through the door me kneeling a confession and that's what he does as well it's like okay it's, we all go here and we do this together and dad does it as well that's important for them to see the father kneeling yes it is the, i once heard a pre sorry go ahead mike i was going to say the other thing with that tim is that in the absence of that sort of absolute north star and orientation point you see people just scrambling for some sort of proxy some sort of idol to orient themselves towards whether yeah it's it's aping some sort of ar archetype of, of machismo or masculinity or even in the political world people you know they'll just be like uh contractualism um Locke said this um uh the declaration of human rights you know the the UN spoke it the human rights therefore and 
there's nothing that that is ultimately anchored to. So all all these structures, all these man-made structures that people individually and collectively orient themselves around, if it's not aimed or properly aimed towards some some absolute fixed point of God the Father, then yeah, then then all these artifacts of man they, they come come crashing down individually and collectively. So that that's in part where we are. Yeah, I didn't want. I, that's that's a great point, Mike. I didn't want today to be like everyone has to marshal evidence and and data and stuff. I just wanted I wanted folks to to hear today's show, you know, parish orphans and I mean that's what I call the audience is parish orphans. That's I'm I'm connecting that right now. Fatherlessness it is the sign of the times. I wanted them to hear an honest conversation between four Catholic men that are trying to work this out. So. Uh, I hope I hope that's what today's show has provided for uh, the parish orphans and the retrogrades out there. Mike, uh, do you want to you want to you got any last shot? You want to tell us what you're working on or, or really a parting shot conceptually, whatever you prefer. Um, Just uh, same thing that we've worked on before. The uh, don't go to college book is still the, the main thing that I'm pushing. And, uh, you know, we need to take back education. We need to take back higher education. And that comes down to. Uh, you know, the, the proper orienting of um, young men and women towards God. And that is not to be found at the secular universities uh, anymore uh, or if it ever was. So don't go to college, marry young, learn to trade, stay local, and uh, don't poison your mind by going to these, uh, these communist uh, brainwashing factories. That's, uh, that's my pardon shot. How about you, Will? I just want to make a couple more points about what the secular data does show, because I mentioned that study earlier. There's some really interesting stuff that we haven't got into. Listen to this one. So a big study of 7,000 kids in the UK compared all different family forms to ones with a biological father in the home. And they see that the kids with the biological father there are significantly better at cognitive tasks. They were measuring uh, spatial problem solving using little pattern squares. They're less depressed. They're just healthier overall. And even when there is a divorce, children who have a biological present, uh, father present, are less likely to be obese. And they hypothesize that this is because the enforcement of rules is easier. So the benefits of biological fathers in the household just go on and on and on. And you can link them to all the different forms of psychological and physical suffering that we see in young men today. Now, if you want to get some more of my content, Substack's probably the best place to find me, my YouTube channel too, and then on Twitter as well. Thanks a lot, Will. And I know the the data, and particularly you're, you're a data miner or a data scientist, is always amazing to back up what we're saying. But I, I was I was glad to hear you. Um, I was glad to hear your thoughts from across the pond, your, your, your personal, personal thoughts uh, about it today too, but. Yeah, if you have any other data, I didn't want to cut you off. I always, I'm always in, because I mean, it's interesting how on this show, we're always kind of collocating anecdotes, philosophy, you know, which is a priori, and then data, which is a posterior. I think, I think it's a real nice mix, and I think that that plays really nicely, even given a kind of delicate topic like this. A lot of people. Are walking around sensitive, ain't they? Well, I mean, this is this is a sensitive topic. Yeah, it is. But like most sensitive topics, it's an important one, and the stuff that hurts people's feelings the most is sometimes the most important thing to say. Aristotle says, Elliot, that to a healthy man, there's nothing less important than a doctor, and that that's kind of what I was saying to you earlier. It's like, man, and in a proper era, pe- people write me enthused for these sea mask shows that we do just high praise that we've gotten in our previous 13 shows and it's like this wouldn't be interesting at all unless it were such a sweeping societal problem so i don't know if you want to figure that into any parting shots you have or any conceptual kind of closers uh nightcaps for the idea the shout outs yeah well, uh, you know, I would say that as men, we're natural problem solvers. That's what men do. That's why we have hard times having conversations with women. Sometimes they just want to be heard. 
We want to solve the problem. Men are solve problem solvers, but vice solves the problem of men. And so if we're listening to this and we're wondering like, where am I falling short as a father? Or how could I step up and be the kind of role model and leader in my home I can be? If you're over drinking, overworking, overeating, playing video games, stuck on the screen, smoking weed, jerking off the porn, it's draining your energy. You're not even seeing the problem. Or if you can see the problem, you have no gusto to go do anything about it because vice solves the problem of men. So I'm plugging my new coaching program right now, War on Vice. Dot com. Go to waronvice.com. If you are a high achiever, businessman, entrepreneur, uh, executive uh, who's doing great out in the world, but struggles to come home and do the right thing for your family, well, we'll work with you to make sure that you destroy that vice for life and dominate your life like you know you should. Beautiful. Waronvice.com. That's that's great. Uh, exciting. Exciting stuff. Paris Robins and Retrogrades. Thanks for tuning in today. It was, I mean, we deal with lots of tricky issues here on my channel, here on all four of our channels, particularly when we come together for CMAS. But this one felt this one felt different for some reason. I think in some ways it's the animating principle behind behind what we're doing with the Christian masculinism project. So I want to thank the audience. I especially want to thank the other three gents, uh, Mike Elliott and will today we'll be back next friday we'll be on uh whose channel is it is that wales no it's elliot next i think oh it's elliot yeah okay so we're hopefully you guys have got the pattern i haven't but uh we go from from you know four of us basically uh each each of the four of us will host one a month as we've been doing this is the 14th show now so god bless you all uh say a prayer for for holy father benedict i know we barely spoke of him today but i was just taking my cue from him and we're, we're still trying to make of what it means that we've been abandoned by our holy father benedict and many people out there are hurting from feeling abandoned by their biological fathers as well wait wait with with full hearts for a better day hopefully help is around the corner god bless you all day as well Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. God bless. Thank you. God bless.